Tony Costa was convicted of brutally murdering and dismembering Patricia Walsh and Mary Ann Wysocki in 1969, but he's suspected of killing as many as eight women over a three-year period. In 1969, police in Truro, Massachusetts unearthed the bodies of four women who had been mutilated almost beyond recognition. They were the victims of Tony Costa, who soon became known as the Cape Cod Vampire. Two of the women, Patricia Walsh and Mary Ann Wysocki, had been visiting nearby province town in January when they mysteriously vanished, and they were last seen with Tony. The other two had been missing since the previous year, but they had also been connected to Costa. Though the four murders were unbelievably gruesome, police didn't think the women were Tony's first victims. In fact, he may have killed as many as eight women between 1966 and 1969, though he was only convicted in the deaths of Patricia and Marianne. The true number of Tony's victims will never be known, as he died by suicide in 1974 while serving a life sentence in prison. However, due to the brutality of his known murders, he's remembered today as America's own Jack the Ripper. Attention of the police was this was the first uh, grave that was found. It was a area which indicated some depression in the ground, and after probing, we found the remains of an unidentified uh, body of a, of a girl. There appear that there, there, there are indications that uh, there are teeth marks on some of these parts of these dismembered bodies. We feel that uh, this, the condition that uh, surrounds these murders, uh, would be something which could be could, could have continued. The the age of the of the decomposed bodies uh, may go back beyond six months, eight months, nine months. Uh, we don't know what took place during that time, and there are at least two or three thousand missing females in the United States, and uh, we don't know how many may be buried in the Truro woods. Anton Charles Tony Costa was born in Cambridge, Massachusetts, on August 2, 1944. He was caught committing his first disturbing crime when he was just 17 years old. One night in November 1961, he broke into a neighbor's apartment. When the teenage girl awoke and saw Tony looming over her, she screamed and he fled. Three days later, however, he returned. Costa tried to drag the girl down the stairs of the building. Neighbors intervened and detained Tony, and he was subsequently convicted of burglary and assault. He received a one-year suspended sentence and three years of probation. At 18, Tony married a teenage girl and fathered three children. Over the years, his marriage fell apart, reportedly due to violence and drug use. By the mid-1960s, Costa was separated from his wife and had started keeping the company of other women, many of whom mysteriously disappeared after meeting him. In 1966, Tony picked up two young women named Bonnie Williams and Diane Federoff and offered to give them a ride to Pennsylvania on his way to California. They were never seen again, and they're now believed to be co-star's first victims. Two years later, his girlfriend in California, Barbara Spaulding, vanished on the very day Costa was leaving to return to Massachusetts. She was never seen again, either. Back in Provincetown, 18-year-old Sydney Monzon disappeared in May 1968 after she was last seen getting into a car with Tony. Then, at September, Costa's new lover Susan Perry vanished as well. When friends asked what happened to her, Costa told them she'd gone to Mexico. Tony and his wife divorced around this time, and after a short stint in jail for failing to pay child support, he met yet another woman named Christine Gallant. Both Costa and Gallant were members of the hippie scene of the 1960s, and they frequently shared drugs. In November 1968, Gallant was found dead in her bathtub from an overdose on barbiturates. Finally, on January 24, 1969, Patricia and Mary Ann arrived at a guest house in Provincetown for a weekend vacation to Cape Cod. The 23-year-old women had driven up from Rhode Island in Walsh's light blue Volkswagen. Upon check-in, their landlady introduced them to a young, local man who was also staying in the home, Tony Costa. The morning after Walsh and Wysocki arrived in Cape Cod, their landlady noticed a note pinned to their bedroom door, as detailed by court documents. It read, 
Could you possibly give me a ride to Churro early in the morning and was signed by Tony. That same afternoon, a witness spotted Costa with the two women in a light-colored Volkswagen. The vehicle was last seen driving toward Churro. Both women failed to keep an appointment in Provincetown later that day. The following day, the landlady discovered another note on the door of Walsh and Wysaki's room. We are checking out. Thank you for your many kindnesses, it read. It was signed Marianne and Patton written on the same type of paper as the previous day's note. The women's belongings were also missing from their room. However, Walsh and Wysaki failed to return home from their weekend in Cape Cod. Their family immediately contacted police, who quickly began investigating. On February 2, 1969, Walsh's Volkswagen was spotted parked in a wooded area near Pine Grove Cemetery in Chiluru. Later that same day, Costa took the car to Boston. Despite his attempt to cover his crimes, police now had an idea of where they should be searching. On February 8, 1969, an officer searching the woods near Pine Grove Cemetery noticed an indentation in the ground. Digging down, he found a bag containing dismembered body parts. The female corpse had been separated into eight sections, but it didn't belong to Walsh or Wysaki, it was Susan Perry, who had gone to Mexico five months earlier. Around the same time, police questioned Costa about Walsh and Wysaki's disappearance. He gave inconsistent answers, and he was soon frantically trying to cover his tracks. On March 3, a telegram for Costa arrived at his mother's house in Provincetown. It read, What happened? We waited as planned. Is everything all right? We'll meet you as scheduled. New York City. Love Pat and Marianne. Investigators determined the telegram had originated from a New York City telephone number that Costa had access to. Police continued searching the Churro Woods, where Costa was known to have a large marijuana garden. On March 5, they unearthed more remains, the torso and severed head of Marianne Wysaki. In another grave nearby was the body of Patricia Walsh, cut in half at the waist. Her skin was peeled off her chest in a fashion like a sweater, so that it was attached only about the shoulders. And beneath Walsh was the dismembered body of Sydney Monzon, the 18-year-old woman who had been missing for nearly a year. Some of the bodies reportedly had bite marks on them, leading to Costa's Cape Cod vampire nickname. A coroner determined Walsh and Wysaki had died from gunshot wounds to the head and neck. A 22 caliber pistol was found buried close by, which was later identified as Costa's gun. Casey Sherman, a true crime author who wrote Town about Costa, viewed photos from the scene while doing research for his book. He later recalled, these women weren't just murdered, they were brutalized, and looked like they had been attacked by a great white shark, not a human killer. He also famously referred to Costa as the most vicious serial killer since Jack the Ripper. On May 29, 1970, Costa was sentenced to life in prison for the murders of Patricia Walsh and Mary Ann Wysaki. Despite the mountains of evidence against him, Costa maintained his innocence throughout his trial. Even after his arrest, Costa told police, there's a maniac on the loose out there, in reference to the women's murders. While in prison, Costa wrote a novel called Resurrection describing the murders in detail. In it, he claimed that a friend named Carl had been responsible for the deaths of Walsh and Wysaki. Tony Costa was found dead in his prison cell on May 12, 1974 at the age of 29. A corrections officer making rounds discovered his lifeless body hanging by a leather belt from the upper bars of his cell. Costa's official cause of death was asphyxiation by hanging, suicide. The Cape Cod vampire took his own life, and with it the truth about how many women he'd actually killed. There should be no odd against killing people. I know it's a wrong thing, but you know, hell, you hell, you restrict somebody from it, they're gonna want it more. We found our victim and sad as it may be, she's our friend, but you know what? We all have to make sacrifices. Our first victim is going to be Cassie's daughter. She's gonna be alone in a big, dark house out in the middle of nowhere. How perfect can you get? I, I mean, like, holy shit, dude. I'm horny just thinking about it. Hell yeah. Idaho teenagers Brian Draper and Tori Adamsik plotted the murder of Cassie Joe Stoddart for weeks in an effort to be just like Scream. 
High school student Cassie Jo Stoddart had the world ahead of her when her life was cut short by two of her classmates, Tori Adamsik and Brian Draper, who wanted to become world-famous killers. Mimicking what they did in the cult horror classic Scream, the two boys stalked and filmed Stoddart before stabbing her to death in September 2006. The killers even had the gall to document their crime on video, a move that would later come back to haunt them. On September 22, 2006, 16-year-old Cassie Jo Stoddart was house-sitting for her aunt and uncle just a few miles away from her own residence in Pocatello, Idaho. That night, Stoddart invited her boyfriend, Matt Beckham, to join her at the house. Beckham, in turn, invited his friend Tori Adamsik who brought along Brian Draper. The two boys were Pocatello born and, unknown to anyone, were keeping a death list that contained the names of several of their friends and classmates. One such name was Cassie Jo Stoddart. The two boys spent about two hours at the house before leaving. But unbeknownst to Stoddart, Draper had unlocked the basement door so that he and Adam Sick could sneak back in later that same evening. September 22nd, 2006. We know there's lots of doors. There, there's lots of places to hide. I locked the back doors. That's all I locked. Now we just gotta wait. When the two boys returned, they parked down the street, put on dark clothing, gloves, and masks. Then, they snuck back into the residence, through the basement door, while Beckham and Stoddart watched TV in the living room. At 10.30 p.m. Beckham left. Draper and Adam Six started to make loud noises in an effort to lure Stoddart down to the basement to scare her. But when that didn't work, the pair located the circuit breaker and turned off all the power in the house. After a while they tried for a second time, the boys threw the circuit breaker and waited, hoping Stoddart would come down to turn the lights back on. When she didn't, the killers went upstairs. Draper was armed with a dagger-style weapon, and Adam Sick had a hunting-type knife in his hands. Draper opened and slammed a closet door hoping to scare Cassie, who was asleep on the couch. When this attempt to frighten her failed, Draper and Adam Sick attacked. The two stabbed her approximately 30 times, 12 of which were fatal. Forensic pathologist Dr. Charles Garrison later testified that most of the fatal wounds struck the right ventricle of Cassie's heart. The killers left her body to bleed out and fled. I just killed Cassie. We just left her house. This is not a fucking joke. I'm shaking. I stabbed her in the throat and I saw her lifeless body just disappear. Dude, oh I just killed God. Cassie. Oh, oh, fuck. That felt like it wasn't real. I mean, it went by so Shut fast. Shut the fuck up. We gotta get our act straight. Okay. The following day, Beckham and Adam Sick met up while Beckham repeatedly tried to call Cassie. Her body wasn't recovered until two days after her murder on September 24, 2006. The responding officers noted that Stoddart's body was covered in blood and riddled with deep lacerations and stab wounds. It didn't take long for investigators to determine that Tori Adam Sick and Brian Draper were the last people to see Cassie Jo Stoddart alive. Tori Adamsik was interrogated that same day, and he initially told detectives that he and Draper had gone to the house at approximately 8.30 p.m. to attend a party. When the party never materialized, he and Draper left the house to catch a film, after which both boys slept at Adamsik's house. But when the detectives probed Adamsik about the movie he had reportedly seen that night, he couldn't remember anything about it. Three days later, Brian Draper led law enforcement to a stash of evidence he buried in the Black Rock Canyon area. The evidence included two dagger-style knives with sheaths, a silver and black-handled knife with a smooth blade, a folding knife, a red and white mask, latex gloves, and a damning videotape that contained footage of both killers explicitly planning Cassie's murder. The tape also included footage of them later reacting to having killed her. On April 17, 2007, Brian Draper was found guilty of first-degree murder and conspiracy to commit murder. One down, one more to go, Cassie's grandfather Paul Cisnero said at the time. Her mother, Anna Stoddart, merely said, I'm just happy. My baby got her justice. Tory Adams' sixth trial began on May 31, 2007, and he was convicted of the same charges on June 8, 2007. 
both received life sentences in prison without the possibility for parole plus 30 years to life for the conspiracy behind their brutal slaying. Adam Sick and Draper are still serving their sentences at the Idaho State Correctional Institution. In September 2010, an appeal was filed on behalf of Adam Sick and one for Draper in April 2011. Their initial appeals were denied but both killers are appealing their convictions in higher courts.